I first came to Brooklyn in the summer of 1933 when my stepfather, Andy White, had just bought the farm in North Brooklyn and the beautiful property across the street and the meadow and the shorefront, the beautiful shorefront down in Allen Cove. And my memory of those days is how much smaller everything was. There were very few cars in town, very few, just a handful of cars up and down. Not everybody had, a, had an automobile. The fields were bare, mostly. All the trees you see were, were gone. The, the fields were mostly bare without trees because all the trees had been cut down for firewood and stovewood. The islands were bare as well, very, very little growth on top of the roads were gravel for the most part, very narrow. All the work in the fields was done by horsepower. There were no tractors that I can remember. There must have been some, a few, but I don't remember them. And the, all the haying at the white at the white place, all the all the mowing and raking and and uh, stowing of hay in the, in the barn was done by horsepower. And as a kid, I loved being on top of the hay wagon as it came in and, and lent my hand. I loved the property it's down at the shore at Allen Cove. There was a, a long dock leading out into tidal water with a float. I would go down there in the early mornings and put out a little fishing line, hand fishing line, with some a mashed up snail for bait and before breakfast and, some to, and hook a flounder, a couple of flounders, then clean them and bring them home and eat, eat a flounder for breakfast that I just caught off the waters of North Brooklyn. I can remember the first year or two that we were here, maybe a little bit later than that, that uh, Steamboat Road, which has the, begins the Haven Colony, ended in a steamboat dock down on, in Center Harbor and where every day a local little steamer, I think the gin named J.T. Morse, white, small steamboat, would pull up and disgorge summer families with their trunks, would move in, would move in to the local colony and spend the summer. The Haven Colony was, the, this boat had come from Rockland, and the passengers had gone had come by boat overnight from Boston to Rockland, and then early in the morning embarked on little local steamers that would take them to ports all around this archipelago. And there was a post office in, on the north side of the road, right near the, the steamboat road, with a, the postmistress, Susie Grindle, the smallest post office in the state of Maine, and maybe anywhere, a tiny tiny little row of boxes. When I turned 15, the summer I turned 15, I sent five dollars, I think, in an envelope and a letter to Augusta, to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, and saying, I am 15, please send my license. That was it. <laughs> a little bit later, when I was a little bit older, the Whites had bought this Secondhand Plymouth Roadster, I think mostly for me, 1928 Plymouth Roadster with a rag top and a bump rumble seat, yellow with black fenders. <laughs> this was my first vehicle, and I, my mother kept thinking I was going to kill myself, but I did begin to go and pick up girls I knew and take them to the movies in Blue Hill or Ellsworth. The movie theater, movies in Blue Hill were in the town hall and twice a week, Tuesdays and Saturdays. And we would go and sit there, and it was a long evening because they had one projector. And at the end of every reel, the lights would come off and they would reload the projector and go on with the movie. There were also movies at the Grand Theater in, in Ellsworth, which is still there, or well, later summers, I, when I got to read my opera teams, I had summer jobs in New York, but one, felt, one summer, I was 16 or 17, the job fell through, and I felt, great, I can be up with the Whites and spend my whole time sailing or playing or seeing my friends. 
And my mother said, no way. And she said I was going to work in the local, in, in the Brooklyn Library, which was much smaller than just before. It was so beautifully restored and changed with librarian Annie Dollar. Annie ran a tight ship. And when modern novels, which the book committee had bought, began to be more explicit about sex and things, Annie put her foot down and she would find one of these couple of novels and look them over and if she didn't like them, she would put them under her chair, hide them under her chair forever and would say, that book is out or that book never came. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> when I was in the Air Force during the war, stationed in Denver, I was sent overseas in the Pacific. And on my last furlough, I came here, and there's a picture of me on the beach there in shorts and a, with a beer can opener hanging from my, over my neck. And this was the place I, I, I uh, left from to go for two and a half years in the, in, in the Pacific, never in combat. Well, Joel was 10 years younger than me, and I remember a great moment what I heard about when he was a teenager, and on the 4th of July here, he was driving around with a summer kid who was uh, pretty adventurous and uh, uh, fairly wild in his doings, uh, Peter Sturdivant. They were driving on the 4th of July and uh, through town, and they fired off a Roman candle, but... Uh, one ball of fire that flew into the front porch of the living room of the first select man of Brooklyn named Eugene Kane. And Joel remembers going back home in North Brooklyn and wondering if that was going to be okay. And then his heart sinking the next day when he saw Eugene Kane's car pulling into the driveway there. He was grounded just about forever. <laughs> never, I never forget. Joel graduated from Cornell and MIT and after a stretch in the Army in Europe, he came here and started the Brooklyn Boatyard on the site where the fish factory had been and became one of the country's best known wooden boat designers and builders. I would charter boats from Hinckley over on Mont Desert, the Bermuda 40s, which were highly, easily saleable yawls for the most part. And would and do local family cruising for a couple of weeks at the boat yard, and I would constantly be going over there for a local something had gone wrong with the engine or something, some part of the of the boat, and he, I'd go over there again and again for ask for a bit of repair. And I began to notice it was kind of one-sided, and I one day said to Joe, "Listen, you want to just." turn this around for a minute and come by to my house and borrow a comma. <laughs> he, liked, he liked this. I also remember discussing sailing with Joe. Eventually, I, I sailed all these waters for over a period of years and knew every cove and, and wrinkle and, and all the ledges and perils and passages and... Uh, all the waterways and islands around here from Pulpit Harbor at the top of North Haven to Soam Sound. I think I remember, I can recall Joel's actual first beginnings as a boat builder when he was about seven or eight years old. And I watched Andy White build a double-ended, a little 10-foot double-ended scow. Andy was uh, capable in every possible way as a countryman, as a planter, as a... Everything he did, he did well. He was not a gentleman farmer in any sense, and he was a wonderful carpenter. And with Joel watching, they built this beautifully constructed little scow, which went into the pond in the meadow, uh, and Joel went down, down there later as a kid and paddled around. There's a treasured family photograph 
taken on the float that came off the, the, the long dock in Allen Cove, where we used to swim as a family every, every morning when we were young. And this mother's the only picture, I think, of my mother with her three children, me and my sister and older sister Nancy and my kid brother Joel. I love the photograph. We would finish each swim with a bite of semi-sweet SS Purse Epicure chocolate. And I remember one night waking up and hearing the sound of machine gun fire out on Blue Hill Bay. Prohibition was still in effect and there was a lot of bootlegging and rum running from Canada up and down the coast. And that's what this was about. I knew what a machine gun sounded like from the movies, of course. Sat straight up in bed. Wow. <laughs> Brooklyn is home to me in so many ways. My, all my, my children, Callie and Alice and John Henry, all learned to, to sail here. And my granddaughters as well, uh, Laura and Lily and Clara. And they also, the older ones, all learned to drive here. My children and grandchildren, John Henry, Laura and Lily, on the Naskeeg Road, which is a uh, some straight stretch where so many people that I know have learned to drive. Sailing and driving, the same thing makes you, makes you at home, makes it part of your home. I can't begin to say how, how much the White's Place in Brooklyn and sailing and this whole beautiful, beautiful scene here meant to me and still means to me and has meant to everybody in my family.